I am reading her Manon Lescu. She sees the association but does not refer to it and merely smiles from time to time. Finally, she closes the little book. Do you not want me to read any further, madame? Not today. I have decided to act the story of Manon in real life. I have a rendezvous at the Cascine, and you, my dear Chevalier, are to accompany me. You will, of course. I obey all your commands. I am not commanding you, but asking you, she said with irresistible charm. She rose, put her hand on my shoulder, and looked at me. Those eyes, she exclaimed. I love you, Severin. You have no idea how much I love you. Yes, I have, I replied bitterly. You love me so much that you're going to a rendezvous with another man. I do this only to arouse your passion, she replied. I am obliged to take admirers so as not to lose you. I do not ever want to lose you, do you hear? For I love you and you alone. She clung passionately to my lips. If only I could give you all my soul in this kiss. But come now. She slipped into a simple black velvet coat and wrapped her head in a dark bashlick. She then walked rapidly down the gallery and entered the carriage. Gregor will drive, she called out to the coachman, who withdrew with a surprised look. I climbed into the driver's seat and began to whip the horses furiously. When we reached the cachine, Wanda alighted at the point where the broad alley narrows to a corridor of lush foliage. It was dark, and a sprinkling of stars shone through the overcast sky. On the banks of the Arno, a man stood watching the muddy waves. He wore a dark cloak that gave him the air of a brigand. Wanda quickly made her way through the shrubbery and tapped him on the shoulder. I can still see him turn toward her and take her hand. Then they both disappeared behind the leafy wall. A whole hour of torment. Finally, I heard the rustle of leaves and they reappeared. He accompanied her back to the carriage. The lantern revealed an incredibly young face that I had not seen before with a gentle and melancholy expression. The bright light played upon his golden ringlets. She held out her hand, which he kissed with deep respect. Then she signaled to me, and in a trice the carriage was speeding past the long line of trees that border the river like a green tapestry. The bell rings at the garden gate. It is a face I know, the man from the Cachine. Whom shall I announce? I ask in French. He shakes his head, embarrassed. Do you understand a little German? Of course, I was asking your name. Alas, I have none yet, he replied, ill at ease. Tell your mistress that the German painter from the Cachine is here and that he would like to ask her. But here she is. Wanda appeared on the balcony and greeted the stranger. Gregor, show the gentleman to my apartment, she ordered. I pointed the way. Please do not bother. I shall find it now. Thank you. Thank you very much. So saying, he bounded upstairs. I remained below, watching the poor German with a deep feeling of pity. Venus in first has trapped his soul in her red curls. He will paint her and lose his reason. A sunny winter's day. A golden haze trembles over the leaves of the trees and over the green carpet of the meadow. Below the balcony, jewel-like camellias are bursting into flower. Wanda is sitting in the loggia, drawing. The German stands opposite her, his hands clasped in adoration, looking, or rather gazing ecstatically at her face, utterly captivated by the vision before him. But she ignores him. She has no eyes for me either as, a spade in hand, I turn over the soil in the flower beds, so that I may see her and feel her presence that acts upon me like music, like poetry. The painter has left. It is extremely daring of me, but I take the plunge. I make my way up to the gallery, draw near to Wanda, and ask, Do you love the painter, mistress? I pity him, she answered, but I do not love him. I love no one. I have loved you as ardently, as passionately, as deeply as I shall ever love, but it is no longer true at present. My heart is empty and dead, and it makes me very sad. Wanda! I cried in painful surprise. Soon you will not love me either, she went on. Tell me when it has happened, and I shall give you back your freedom. I shall remain your slave all my life, for I adore you and always shall, I cried, seized again by the frenzied passion that had repeatedly been so fatal to me. Wanda looked at me with an oddly satisfied air. Consider this well, she said. 
I have loved you infinitely, and I have treated you tyrannically to gratify your desires. There are still some traces of the tender feelings that once found their echo in your heart, but when they too have disappeared, who knows whether I shall still want to free you. I could well become a monster of cruelty, and have no other desire but to torment and torture you, to watch the man who adores me die of love, while I remain indifferent or even love another. Consider this well. I have thought about it for a long time, I answered, burning with fever. I cannot exist without you. I shall die if you set me free. Let me be your slave. Kill me, but do not turn me away. Very well then, be my slave. Only remember that I no longer love you, and that consequently, your love means no more to me than the attachment of a dog to its mistress. And dogs are meant to be kicked. Today I went to see the Venus de Medici. It was early yet, and the small octagonal chamber in the tribuna was like a shadowy sanctuary. I stood in deep meditation, my hands clasped before the silent image of the goddess. But I did not stay long in this position. There was no one in the gallery, not even an Englishman, and I knelt down before the statue. I gazed up at the maiden's sweet, lissom body, at her full breasts, her voluptuous face with its half-closed eyes, and the perfumed curls on either side of her head that seemed to conceal tiny horns. My mistress's bell. It was noon, but she was still in bed, with her arms folded behind her head. I am going to bathe, she said, and you shall attend me. Lock the door. I obeyed. Now go downstairs and make sure that everything is properly locked there as well. As I descended the spiral staircase leading from her bedroom to the bath, my knees shook and I had to steady myself by clutching the banister. After checking that the garden door was locked, I returned. Wanda was now seated on the bed, her hair undone, in her great velvet jacket edged with fur. A sudden movement revealed to me that she had nothing on but her jacket, and I was inexplicably afraid. I felt like a condemned man who knows he must go to the scaffold and yet begins to tremble on seeing it. Come, Gregor, take me in your arms. What did you say, mistress? You're to carry me, do you understand? I lifted her. She put her arms about my neck and I slowly descended the stairs. Her hair brushed my cheek from time to time and her foot rested gently against my knee. I trembled under my lovely burden and thought I might fall at any moment. The bathroom was a spacious rotunda, softly lit from a red glass dome in the ceiling. Two palm trees spread their broad leaves in a roof of green above the red velvet couch, and a few red carpeted steps led down to the wide marble bath in the center. There is a green ribbon on my bedside table, said Wanda as I laid her on the couch. Bring it to me, and also bring the whip. I flew upstairs and down again, and, kneeling before my sovereign lady, presented the two objects to her. She made me tie her heavy hair charged with electricity into a large chignon, which I fastened with the velvet ribbon. I then had to prepare her bath, and this I did very clumsily, for my hands and feet refused to obey me. From time to time, I felt compelled to glance at my beauty, as though some magical force were driving me. At the sight of her lying on the red velvet cushions, her precious body peeping out between the folds of sable... I realized how powerfully sensuality and lust are aroused by flesh that is only partly revealed. My feelings grew stronger still when the bath was filled and Wanda, in one sweep, threw off her fur wrap and appeared to me like the goddess of the tribuna. At that moment she seemed as saintly and chaste in her unveiled beauty as the statue of the goddess, and I fell on my knees before her and devoutly pressed my lips to her foot. My soul that had been rocked a while ago by such a storm of emotion, was now suddenly pacified. There was not a trace of cruelty about her. She slowly walked down the steps. I was able to contemplate her in peaceful joy, untouched by a single atom of suffering or desire. Her body gleamed through the crystal clear water, and the waves she produced lapped lovingly around her. How right is the nihilist asthete when he says that a real apple is more beautiful than a painted apple, and a living body than a Venus of stone? A silent rapture overcame my whole being when she rose from the bath, the drops of silvery water and the pink light streaming down her. I wrapped the linen towel around her to dry her wonderful body. 
and the same peaceful bliss remained with me as she rested her foot upon me as on a footstool and lay back on the cushions in her great velvet cloak. The supple furs greedily caressed her cold marble body. Her left arm, on which she supported herself, lay like a sleeping swan amid the dark sable, while her right hand toyed with the whip. My eyes alighted by chance on the massive mirror that hung opposite, and I let out a cry. Our reflections in its golden frame were like a picture of extraordinary beauty. It was so strange and fantastic that I felt a deep pang of regret that its forms and colors would soon vanish like a cloud. What is it? asked Wanda. I pointed to the mirror. Ah, yes, it is beautiful, she said. What a pity we cannot capture this moment. Why not? I asked. Would not the most famous painter be proud if you allowed him to immortalize you? I shudder to think that this extraordinary beauty, these mysterious green eyes and wild fiery hair, and all the splendor of this body should be lost forever. It fills me with the terror of death and nothingness. But the artist's hand must save you from this. You must not, like the rest of us, vanish irrevocably without leaving any trace of your existence. Your image must survive long after you have turned to dust. Your beauty must triumph over death. Wanda smiled. What a pity there is no Titian or Raphael in Italy today, she said. However, love can be a substitute for genius. Who knows, perhaps our little German, she mused. Yes, he must paint me, and I shall ensure that love mixes the colors on his palette. The young painter has set up a studio in the villa. She has captured him in her net. He has just begun a Madonna, a Madonna with red hair and green eyes. Only the idealism of a German could make a virginal portrait of such a woman. The poor fellow is almost a bigger donkey than I, and our misfortune is that Titiana has too soon discovered our ass's ears. Now she is making fun of us, and how she laughs. I can hear the sounds of her mirth coming from the studio as I stand under her open window, waiting. Is it I? I cannot believe it. You must be mad to paint me as a Madonna. She bursts out laughing again. Wait a moment. I want to show you a portrait of me, one that I painted myself. You shall copy it. Her head appears in the window, her hair fiery in the sunlight. Gregor! I rush up the stairs, through the gallery, and into the studio. Take him to the bathroom, orders Wanda, and she disappears. We enter the rotunda and lock the door from the inside. A few moments later, Wanda arrives, dressed only in her furs, with the whip in her hand. She descends the stairs and stretches out on the velvet cushions as she had done before. I lie down in front of her and she places one of her feet on me while her right hand plays with the whip. Look at me, she says, with your deep fanatical look. There, that is right. The painter turns dreadfully pale. He devours the scene with his beautiful melancholy eyes. His lips open, but he remains silent. Well, how do you like this picture? Yes, that is how I shall paint you, says the German. But one could hardly say that he spoke. It was more like the moan of a soul sick unto death. The charcoal drawing is finished. The head and bust are sketched in. Already her diabolical face appears in a few bold lines, and life flickers in her green eyes. Wanda stands before the canvas with folded arms. This painting like many of the Venetian school, is intended to be both a portrait and a story, declares the painter, still deathly pale. And you will call it? she asks. But what is the matter? Are you ill? I am afraid I, he begins, darting a hungry glance at the lovely woman in furs. But let us talk about the painting. I imagine that the goddess of love has come down from Olympus to visit a mortal, so as not to die of cold in this modern world of ours, she wraps her sublime body in great heavy furs and warms her feet on the prostrate body of her lover. I imagine the favorite of this beautiful despo, who is whipped when his mistress grows tired of kissing him, and whose love only grows more intense the more he is trampled underfoot. I shall call the picture Venus in Furs. The painter works slowly, but his passion is fast increasing. I am afraid he will end up by killing himself. She teases him with riddles that he cannot solve and taunts him until he is driven to distraction. 
During the sitting, she sucks sweet meats and rolls the wrappers into pellets, which she flicks at him. I am glad you were in such high spirits, madame, says the painter, but your face has completely lost the expression I need for my painting. The expression you need for your painting, she smiles. Wait a moment. She rises to her feet and deals me a blow with the whip. The painter gapes in childish wonder, half horrified and half admiring. As she whips me, Wanda's face gradually recovers the cruel, ironic appearance that fills me with such rapture. Is this the right expression for your portrait? She asks. The painter is dumbfounded. He lowers his eyes to evade her piercing stare. That is the right expression, he stammers. But I can no longer paint. What is the matter? asks Wanda mockingly. Can I be of any assistance? Yes, cries the German, as though taken with madness. Whip me too. With pleasure, she replies, shrugging her shoulders. But if I am to whip you, I must do it properly. Whip me to death, cries the painter. Will you let me tie you up? she asks with a smile. Yes, he sighs. Wanda leaves the room for a moment and returns with a length of rope. Well now, are you brave enough to put yourself at the mercy of Venus and Furs, the beautiful despo, she taunts. Tie me up, replies the painter with the voice of a dying man. Wanda ties his hands behind his back, winds a rope around his arms and another around his body, and attaches him to the bars of the window. She then throws off her furs, picks up the whip, and stalks to him. The scene holds an awesome fascination. I feel my heart beat as she laughingly steps back to deal the first blow. The whip hisses through the air, and he starts slightly as he feels its bite. Then she begins to whip him without stopping, her mouth half open, her teeth gleaming between her red lips, until the pitiful blue eyes beg for mercy. It is indescribable. She now poses alone for him. He is working on her head. She has stationed me in the adjoining room, behind the heavy dividing curtain, where I can see everything without being seen. But what is she up to? Is she afraid of him? She has driven him mad enough. Or is this meant to be a new torture for me? My knees shake at the thought. They are talking to one another. He is speaking in such a low voice that I cannot hear a thing, and she replies in the same tone. What does all this mean? Is there some secret understanding between them? I am suffering horribly, and my heart threatens to leap from my breast. Now he is kneeling before her. He embraces her and leans his head against hers, and she, the cruel woman, laughs, and I hear her exclaim, Ah, you need the whip again. Woman, goddess, is there no love in your heart? cries the German. Do you not know what it is to love, to be consumed with longing and passion? Can you not imagine what I suffer? Have you no pity for me? No, she replies contemptuously, but I have the whip. She draws it deftly out of the pocket of her fur jacket and lashes him full in the face. He rises and staggers back. Can you paint now? She asks indifferently. He does not answer, but takes his place again before the easel. The picture is very successful. It is a good likeness, but it seems idealized because of the bright, supernatural, even diabolical colors. The painter has put into his work all his distress, his adoration, and his wretchedness. Now he is painting me. We spend a few hours alone together each day. Today he turned to me suddenly and asked in a voice trembling with emotion, Do you love her? Yes. I love her also. His eyes were filled with tears. He was silent for a moment and turned back to the canvas. We have a mountain in Germany where she dwells, he murmured as though to himself. That woman is a demon. When the painting was finished, Wanda offered him a regal sum for his work. Oh, but you have paid me already, he said with a pained smile. Before leaving, he opened his portfolio with a mysterious air and allowed me to peep inside. It was a shock to see her face staring at me, as live as a reflection in a mirror. I am keeping that one, he said. It is mine. She cannot take it away from me. I have earned it dearly enough. I really feel sorry for that poor painter, said Wanda today. 
It is absurd to be as virtuous as I am, do you not think? I dared not reply. Oh, I forgot that I was speaking to a slave. I must go out. I want to be distracted, to forget. Quick, my carriage.